to an online event of the Affiliation of Christian Biologists. My name is Brian Groyle, and I'm president of the ACB. It seems fitting to begin a new academic year with an online event devoted specifically to biology education or to science education in general. And I'd like to give a special shout out to all of the biology teachers and students or, or uh, teachers and students in other science disciplines uh, that are joining us this evening. Tonight, we are delighted to have ASA fellow April Cordero as our guest speaker. April is a professor of biology and the associate provost of educational effectiveness at Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego. She received her bachelor of science degree in general biology at the University of California in San Diego, followed by a master of arts degree at UCSD in teaching and learning with an emphasis on curriculum design in biology education. April then completed a PhD in mathematics and science education within the division of biological sciences at UCSD and San Diego State University. April's research has focused on developing more effective approaches for teaching ecology and evolution that enable students to develop not only factual knowledge, but biological ways of thinking and reasoning about the living world. As a Christian biologist trained in science education research, she has in a, she's in a unique position to investigate student perceptions of the relationship between the Christian faith and of uh, scientific issues that may evoke controversy like origins or especially human origins and evolution. April gave a, a TEDx talk on evolution and faith and she was featured in a BioLogos-sponsored documentary called From the Dust. She's also active in several professional development projects with school teachers and university biology faculty. Uh, she's currently the board vice chair with BioLogos and was a co-author of the BioLogos Integrate Curriculum, which we featured in an online event in May of 2023. Tonight, April will draw from best practices in biology education, as well as her 30 years of experience teaching biology at both a, a large public high school and uh, a Christian university. Uh, the title of her presentation is Teaching and Learning of Biology as a Faith-Building Experience. April, thank you for joining us this evening. Absolutely. I'm so glad to be here. My title was Teaching and Learning of Biology as a Faith-Building Experience, but I added in science because the uh, philosophical ideas behind why uh, what I'm talking about today it just applies to any science program or anything that people are teaching in science or even for science learners. So uh, thank you, Brian, for that really nice um, description of my background. You guys don't need to hear that again. I am at Point Loma Nazarene, and I am planning to share my slide presentation in full because I have a lot of links and various other things on slides that I'm going to show you things, but this slide presentation will be available. So if you want to go to any of those sites, you'll have access to it. So I want to let you know that. And then you would have access to my contact information as well. So. Um, I am going to jump in because I've been teaching biology a long time and I've had so much fun uh, learning and changing what I do. And I was in secular environments and I've been in Christian environments. And so what I want to talk about, I think, can apply no matter where you're at. So let's just jump into faith building in general and what I mean by that and why it matters. And ultimately, it's cultivating a godly reflection and practice into our academic life. And so, you know, why? Who cares? Why should we do this? I started reading uh, in the 2000s. I'm not even sure exactly when I started reading some various books about integrating faith into the classroom. I started at Point Loma Nazarene in 2007, just probably shortly thereafter. And these are some of the books that have had an influence on me over time and why I find it so important to integrate the faith 
opportunities for students and faith growing and cultivating that with my students. So first off, Mark Knoll's book, you probably know about Jesus Christ and the life of the mind. Mark says, Christian faith can enhance intellectual engagement in academic disciplines. If you don't know this book, Mark uses the ancient Christian creeds to show how they can supply motives, guidance, and a framework for learning. So it's a really influential book for me to just see my pursuit of science as also a Christian pursuit. Uh, Tim Keller's book, same thing, uh, Every Good Endeavor. Tim says, there is a God, there is a future healed world that he will bring about, and your work is showing it in part to others. And we apply that to our role. If you're an instructor, if you're teaching students, how what do we want to impart? And how are we going to impart this idea about God? Keller's book, um, he talks about integrating our work with our faith. And the Christian view of work is that we work to serve others and not ourselves. I wrote myself a note. One way to serve our students is to help them see ways to connect their faith with their science work or their passion to work in science, to see their pursuit of science as a way of being faithful. And that's a really different perspective than a lot of church or youth groups may have uh, shared with their um, congregants. Lots of times I get a lot of students from a variety of different backgrounds, but a lot of them will say, you know, I was told not to pursue science because you can't pursue science as a Christian and things like that. So we have this opportunity to really turn that around on its head and say the pursuit of science is a pursuit of better understanding God and, and ways we can do that. So we need to see that as part of our vocation as instructors. And then finally, the Smith and Smith book, if you don't know David Smith and James Smith, they're not related. They just happen to share the same last name. It was a great book. In fact, they have another book out of uh, I believe David Smith has another book on the same similar topic, but I haven't read it yet. This one's Teaching and Christian Practices. I really, I've read this book a couple times over a couple different years, but this provides a guide for how to integrate faith into the classroom. And it is a lot of examples from uh, several different disciplines, including science. And um, the Smiths, I'm not sure which one actually wrote this sentence, but we must take a closer look at the possible relationship between historic Christian practices and the practices that characterize courses and classrooms. So this is one of our opportunities. And so just two days ago, I'd already made my slide presentation, I'm ready to go a couple weeks ago. And uh, I saw a piece from Christian Scholars Review. It was written by Cam Pierce. And it's called Fostering the Intersection of Scripture and Business Education Through Spiritual Assignments. And so, of course, you know, I was doing this talk. I had to go take a look at this article. But I wanted to, right at the beginning of the article, um, this person, Cam, has a few questions. And it was really interesting to, to read these questions. I wanted to read a few to you. Are you integrating spiritual assignments to be see, to be perceived in a holy way? or are you earnestly diverting attention to the Lord? That was, I thought that was a really great way to get us to think about this. Are you checking a box of a school's mission to flaunt the alliance in an exterior way? Or does your exuberant desire to have students know and love Christ and scripture motivate you? And then a little down on that paragraph, applying the skill sets you teach to a spiritual realm is praiseworthy. I implore you to do it with pure and lovely motivation, as well as repentance of any false motivations. And I just thought that was beautiful. So really, what is our agenda? What is our purpose of doing this? So let me tell you where the rest of this talk is going to go since I gave you my why. Oh, before that, let me tell you about the excuses I hear. I hear these all the time as I talk to all kinds of different groups of instructors about integrating faith into their science classroom. I have so much to cover. I've got to cover atoms to ecosystems. There's no time. Yeah, I know. We have so much to cover. It doesn't matter if this is a valuable and important thing to do. You find little corners and little avenues to insert this in ways that doesn't take away from what you need to cover, 
but enhances it. And you can absolutely do that. So I will give tons of examples of that. Uh, I'm a scientist. I'm not a theologian. I don't know how to do it. Well, read some of those books. Read the Chris, the Smith and Smith book. You'll have this side presentation. You can Google examples. There's a lot of ways to do this. That's just, it's just not a hard push. You do not need to be a theologian and you don't need to know, you know, your, your psychology, philosophy, and theology information in order to be able to integrate this in the classroom. I'm not at a Christian university. I teach at a public school. Great. We need you teaching in a public school. And we can infuse the beautiful practices, Christian practices, into these environments without calling them Christian practices. Jesus loved a ton without calling it a Christian practice. So I think we can do the same thing and we can implement these in our classrooms. So if we don't help students see the pursuit, uh, sorry, I have this funny little thing on my screen. If we don't help see students see the pursuit of science as a part of their faith, who will? I always think of, of the verse which says, it, uh, who shall I send, God asks. It should be send me. So you're being asked to get in there and do this. So let me share again with you. But there we go. Clicking buttons, but nothing's happening. Uh, so this is five faith building opportunities I'm going to share with you. And we always hear about on wonder. So when everyone says, oh, you teach science. Oh, great. You get a great opportunity to do on wonder. Well, Yes, it is a great opportunity you all wonder. And we can do even more than that. So I'm going to get into some other ways. I'm going to tackle one of these little blue uh, spheres at a time. I'll do on wonder. And then we're going to flip over to a Padlet where you're going to have an opportunity to give even more ideas. Then I'll come back. I'll do being hospitable. We'll go off to the Padlet and you can type in some ideas. And we're going to do that for each one of these five. So that's my plan for this session. So let's just dive into the first one on wonder. Psalm 104 is beautiful. I can share with you the other verses I have in my talk, but uh, Psalm 104 is long. If you don't know it well, you should look it up, ponder it, sit tonight when you go to bed, and just read through it, because it is a beautiful, beautiful way to think about the majesty of God. And so how can we do that? So uh, I have the authors of some of these quotes in the bottom right corner. This is the director of Thrive U.S. Chris Schoon wrote, the faith practice of wonder helps us glimpse with surprise just how creative, faithful, good, big, and present God is. The awe that accompanies wonder leads us into a greater appreciation for God and the world God has made. So we can even have an appreciation in a secular school or secular classroom for just how amazing earth is and our ecosystem and our biosphere. Another one, Francis Collins, uh, I believe God did intend in giving us intelligence to give us the opportunity to investigate and appreciate the wonders of his creation. God is not threatened by our scientific adventures. So let's take a quick look at how we might do something like this in the classroom. Cultivating on wonder. So I, um, We'll pick a random day in my curriculum, especially a day when I feel a bit overwhelmed by all the grading I have to do. <clears throat> and so I'll carve out a day where I can start class a little different. And so I got this uh, one, this idea, even though it wasn't for a science class, it was for a German class, I believe. But I got this idea from the Smith & Smith book uh, probably uh, more than a decade ago. And I shut the lights off and turn them down. We have windows in our classroom, so still plenty bright. So that when the students come in, the lights are down and I have music playing, some very, I call it majestic music, some beautiful classical music playing in the background. And then I have on the screen these really awe-inspiring images. And so what I want to do, I have two links here. And again, like I said in the notes, you've got those links, but I just wanted to click out to the internet to show you. Whoops, pull this down here. So one of these awe-inspiring links is this beautiful stuff from NASA that they've got these incredible, incredible pictures of our universe. This one's my favorite. This is the initiation of a new star. 
So just showing these kinds of pictures with majestic beauty behind it and just talking through, giving some time for your students to just reflect. You're like, oh, it's a biology class. I don't want to show this. Fine. There's plenty of biology pictures out there for you to show. So this is a Smithsonian link I have in the, in the notes of the slides. This is a beautiful atlas moth. Uh, these were award-winning pictures that people sent in. This one's fascinating. Salamanders in a carnivorous pitcher plant. Look at this image. This is amazing. It makes me want to know what's going on. What am I looking at, right? How can you not feel on wonder? Here's another one that even my engineering husband looked at and said, oh, that's cool. Slime mold fruiting bodies on a log. There's just nothing but these fabulous pictures here. Red algae under a microscope. So there's plenty of places to go. Here's a jellyfish to inspire on wonder. Before I jump back to my slide presentation, um, there's one more thing I have on there that says uh, about a video that goes from um, small to large and small. You can you know, help zooming in and out. And I have found one of those videos recently. So I'm just gonna show you a tiny little bit of it. Um, I'm gonna keep fast forwarding. <laughs> And it zooms out. You saw it was a person laying on the grass. And it zooms out further and further and further. You end up out into the universe. It's much more interesting to watch, fascinating, as it continues to go. And you don't fast forward it like I'm doing. But you know, you guys can watch on your own. And then it starts zooming back in. And it zooms back in. You'll see this person laying on the grass. And then it zooms, as you'll see in a moment, into anatomy and physiology, which is super interesting, I guess. It gets into the biology. Perhaps people, you get system. Just moving forward, I'm jumping. You can watch this, and then you get into the etc. So you get the gist of where that was going. So the beauty of that, I, I often show that to my students. They don't realize scale. And when you help them make a connection to scale, they always seem to have sort of a wow sort of feeling. So um, it's a great video for doing that. Another thing you can do uh, to inspire some awe or just some wonder, like uh, curiosity, I guess I would say, get outside of the classroom. If you ever can, especially if you're a biology instructor, I don't care if you have, if you're in a, in a downtown area, there's very little, little nature. You can find a tree or, or a abandoned lot where you could look at all the weeds and the neat growth and how that occurs. There's just so much you can look at. We, while I have an incredible campus and we're on the ocean, I actually don't take my students to the ocean on day one. I, uh, I talk to them in email prior to classes starting. I send them an email. I tell them, uh, don't wear heels, wear comfortable clothing, we're going to be walking into the canyon. And I tell them that ahead of time. So they show up to my class, I say, okay, you guys can read, you got into college, the syllabus is on Canvas, you have a homework assignment to read the syllabus and fill out a few things. All right, are you ready to go? You need a piece of paper and a pencil, let's go. And I walk them over to the canyon, we have a canyon just adjacent to our campus. And I have a task where they go through the canyon and they look at things, comparing things that are living, non-living, and once lived, and we create these categories. And then we spend the next few days doing a variety of things with that idea. That's day one. I want them to realize we're going to get out into nature. I want them to notice things. And they, and day one, are starting to talk about, is a feather alive or not alive or once lived? Is poop, which they find all the time in our canyon, is it alive? Is it not alive? Is it once lived? And so already they're engaging in really neat conversations. That's wonder. That's getting them excited. And then you can help to make those connections to creation. So those are some of the things that I've done. So now I'm going to do this five times for the five different practices. Uh, Brian is going to put in the chat this link. We're going to have you go to this link and you're going to click on the little plus in the corner. So on the bottom right corner, there's a plus. You are going to click on the plus. It's probably at some point going to ask you what you want your name to be. You can make up a name. It doesn't even matter. You can type in your idea here, type idea here. You hit publish. 
your idea will show up on the screen. If I like your idea, I can hit a little heart. If I add an idea, I can say, uh, you know, also check out this. And that's how you put this in here in your Padlet. Everyone should have access to it. So I'd like to take two, three minutes. I see people already at the top have entered the screen. What are some other ways that we can cultivate awe and wonder with students in a science classroom? I know you have those ideas. So start typing. We'll give a moment or two. I wish I had that background music I could play. Well, you throw your ideas on here. Yay! <laughs> All right. We got it working. I'm going to wait a few more minutes, another minute or so. Pointing out the elegance of equations. Love it. Immunofluorescent images of the cell. Yes. Somebody has a link for that. To toss it in there in the comment. Show the beauty. Intricacy of specimens under the microscope. Histology. Absolutely. Use the app. Picture this and have them go out and find plants, identify new things. Great idea. We have Wonder Wednesdays every week. Oh, tell more. What is Wonder Wednesday? Write in the comment there. Tell more. What does that mean to you in your class? Um, Hands-on experience in the wonder of nature. Great. And you give another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll swing back for the second practice. If you like any of these or you want to add anything into the comments to somebody else's, you can do that. How small is the microbial world? Perfect. Teach human anatomy and physiology by questioning. Constructing a human in class. Yes. Using the properties of tissues. So you guys have great ideas. You don't need me. Look at all this great stuff. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for contributing. We're going to do that four more times with the different practices. So you can keep getting on there and you now have access to that. So you can borrow other people's ideas because you now have that on your uh, on your own personal screen. So we are going to move to intellectual humility. Well, I have here 1 Corinthians 8, 2. Uh, this is the New American Standard Bible. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. That's good for any of us to be keeping in mind. So here's something uh, Mark Leary from Duke University wrote. Recognizing that a particular personal belief may be fallible, accompanied by an appropriate attentiveness to limitations in the evidentiary basis of that belief and to one's own limitations in obtaining and evaluating relevant information. I'm going to read that again because it is a mouthful, but it's spot on. Recognizing that a particular personal belief may be fallible, accompanied by an appropriate attentiveness to limitations in the evidentiary basis of that belief and to one's own limitations in obtaining and evaluating relevant information. So intellectual humility for me, in short, would involve recognizing that my beliefs and my opinions might be incorrect. It's interesting with some people, uh, I've noticed a lot of students, I will say, feel that they know a lot about a handful of topics and they're so sure they have it right. And so intellectual humility is something that we can really help them to develop. So why is it why is it that important to develop it? Uh, Peter Hill did some research. He was asking an interesting question. Can deeply religious people be intellectually humble? And so what he looked at was religious commitment. So how, how strong of a commitment do people have? And then their lack of intellectual humility. So this is not a causal, this is a correlational, but he found that if they have a lack of intellectual humility and a lot of religious commitment, this can lead to increased depression, increased anxiety, and increased doubts about ultimate meaning. So there's a correlation between these things. So we can help our students to gain some intellectual humility and to realize Maybe there's something here I can learn. There's a way I can grow. This can this can help them in many ways, both in their personal life and their faith life and, and for their uh, mental health. So cult cultivating intellectual humility. Hmm. In some ways, I have a desire to help my students confront their lack of knowledge. And so what I'm going to show you, this activity I've used um, 
I did not write this activity. In fact, when I took over this course in 2008 or 2009, uh, the person had given me their slides and this was an activity in their slides that they got from somebody else. So I cannot properly credit this. I cannot take credit for it. I've modified it through the years, but the gist of it is I'm going to show you exactly the slides in the order I show the students. And what I want you to know is the students would use a polling app on their phone to give me my responses. So the first question I ask them on a question, on a scale of one to five, how well versed are you on the issue of creation evolution? And I would ask this question the day I would start the evolution unit. And so very knowledgeable all the way to very unknowledgeable. Or I, should, I said that backwards. And shockingly, I get a lot of freshmen, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, telling me they are C, D, and E, a lot of D, a lot of D. And that always surprises me because, you know, I, I'm not even sure how high I would go on this issue, but they are very confident. They know a lot because they learned it. And, you know, sometimes I'll have them uh, do a Padlet or something. Where did you learn about creation evolution? And they'll tell me, you know, youth group or various things. The next slide says, how many of these authors do you recognize? And they put an A, B, C, D, or E in the uh, in their um, phone app. And so I'll give you a, a second to just glance at these. A number of students will recognize, usually around, I would say B and C are pretty common. Sometimes D, of course, I always have one or two students that will put an E in there. Then I ask the next question, how many of these authors have you read? I get a lot, and, and it's anonymous, they're clickers, so I'm like, why would you lie? I tell my students, you know, what's the point of that? A lot of students, A, some students, B, occasionally I'll get a student or two of C, D, or E. And I'm talking, my classes are usually 60 to 70 for my uh, ecology and evolution course. And so once I show them these authors, Oh, uh, how many how how many of you have read at least one from each column? Almost everybody says no. There's always one in the class that says yes, whether I believe them or not, I don't know. There's always one. Okay, and then I put this back up. Okay, on a scale of one to five, how well versed do you think you are? And everybody is A or B, even a person who ranks really high. And so what that does for us as a class, as a group, is that we can start talking about, okay, we have something we can learn here because I go, I'm go, going to go up again to this slide. I talk about how we've got creation scientists, we've got um, intelligent design, and then we've got people who accept evolution, both Christians and non-Christians. And so, you know, it gives me a chance to say that there's a lot we can learn, there's a lot areas we can grow, but it helps them realize maybe I don't know as much as I thought I did. And that was really my goal, is to help them to be a little more open. So considering that, I now need your ideas, because I don't have a lot of great other ideas for this. So you're going to go to the one that's called Intellectual Humility. I am going to go to that on my screen, which is the second one here. Error analysis in labs. Good one. That's a great idea. Never thought about using that, capitalizing on that to, to focus on intellectual humility. Not being afraid to say, I don't know. Yes. In my origins class, I often say that I don't have a simple answer to some of the theological questions. Both of those together are beautiful. If we, as the instructor, can say, I don't know. And sometimes I've been uncomfortable saying that because it's something I should know. Um, and I will say to them, you know what? I learned that. I learned it in college, but I don't remember it. So can I get back to you on it? Study retractions of scientific pages. Great. How many have read the Bible from cover to cover? <laughs> Perfect. Discussing the concept of scientific consensus and historical examples of the consensus being found to be wrong. If you guys like any of these, Mark, push, click on the hearts. You should be able to like. Uh, you can add in a comment, read scientific papers. Your papers are with comments about uncertainty in the results. Wonder Wednesday isn't just about on wonder, but I wonder what are you questioning? I like it. 
stating that a good response to a question is, I do not know, but then say, I think the response might be, I love it. These are great. If you have any more, oh, I often tell students that we're just scratching the surface of the topic under discussion. How many books of the Bible can you name? Yeah. These are great. Review other person's lab reports, tell stories about something you believe, but found was wrong. Yeah. These are excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of those. You can continue adding to that. I'm going to move to the next practice that we could um, help facilitate and cultivate in our classroom, and that's being hospitable. So I have 1 Peter 4, 9. This is from the NIV. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I can honestly say I have to emphasize that last part to myself a lot with some people in my life. I call them EGRs, extra grace required people. So um, yes, I have this very long page tonight, which you never do in slides. I'm going to do a few of these because I want to define this for you of how I think about hospitality or being hospitable in a science classroom because it's from Henry Nowen. So I'm going to just read it because it does so much of a better job than anything I could say out loud. And I read that we, at my class. We do this in my class. We actually read this out loud. Hospitality means primarily the creation of a free space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. It's not to bring men and women over to our side, which I struggle with because I want everyone to accept evolution, right? But to offer freedom not disturbed by dividing lines. It is not to lead our neighbor into a corner where there are no alternatives left, but to open a wide spectrum of options for choice and commitment. It is not an educated intimidation with good books and good stories and good works, but the liberation of fearful hearts so that words can find roots and bear ample fruit. It is not a method of making our God and our way into the criteria of happiness, but the opening of an opportunity with others to find their God and their way. The paradox of hospitality is that it wants to create emptiness, not a fearful emptiness, but a friendly emptiness where strangers can enter and discover themselves as created free free to sing their own songs, speak their own languages, dance their own dances, free also to leave and follow their own vocations. Hospitality is not a subtle invitation to adopt the lifestyle of the host, but the gift of a chance for the guest to find their own. This, I don't care how many times I read it, this is so beautiful and emphasizes so many different things. In our politically charged society right now, this is so true. And I struggle with this so much in our political society with people with differing views from me. But really, am I providing empty space or am I engaging in conversation just to get them over to my side? Um, in my evolution course, I would consider it to be a success if all of my students left my course after eight weeks of evolution and accepted it, including humans. So that doesn't happen. And so what I let them know is, I'm going to teach you about evolution, but you can hold any view you want. And what you can't do is hold an anti-evolution view without understanding evolution. That's not okay. Augustine talks about that. There's a, there's a lot about, you know, not understanding something, but being against it or being angry about it. So I allow them, they write a paper at the end of my semester about evolution and faith, and they can hold any view. And we have a, engage in a lot of conversations about how to provide this space, how to engage in dialogue. We come back to this. I will throw this up on the screen sometimes just at the start of class before while students are coming in and they just read it again. So how, how does this enact itself further? Um, there's being hospitable and then there's hostility. And of course, we understand the difference between being hospitable and being hostile towards somebody. But it's really important, in my opinion, to help them think about the difference between being hospitable and being tolerant. Is tolerant enough? 
because tolerant does not match what we read by Henry Nowen. Can you be hospitable, which is more than tolerant? So this provides itself in biology, uh, views on evolution, obviously, uh, stem cell research, or biological warfare, or genetically modified organisms, clinical trials in developing countries, human genetic engineering. So when we eventually go to our next Padlet, you can add even more topics that where we need to learn how to be more hospitable and allow other people to hold the views they hold to allow empty space that we're not trying to convince them that their view is wrong and ours is right. Uh, you guys for sure can throw in way more views than that. What I have on my second bullet here is, is not civil dialogue. Civil dialogue is about tolerance. I'm going to tolerate you, so I'm going to be civil. We really want inviting dialogue. I want to understand why you don't agree with me on topic X. I, I want to ask you questions. I want to understand it. That's really what I want to get the students to that. It takes away a lot of judgment if they can just have that demeanor towards them. So how do I do this in the classroom? So uh, some of my research, I looked, um, oh, was it 2014? It was my first sabbatical. I looked at research in psychology. I was really trying to understand how to help Christian students who wanted to direct evolution. To just how do I open them up to even just learn about it? So um, I looked at the literature in psychology that had to do with how do you help a patient who's terminal understand or come come to accept that they're dying. And I looked at a lot of that literature and some of the take home messages from that were first, we have to listen to them. They will not hear us if they're against whatever we're talking about. If we don't, if they don't first feel that we've heard them. Now, how do I do that in a class of 70? I'll share that with you in a minute. They want to be heard if they're going to open up and listen. Then you can teach once they know you've heard them, and then you can have them reflect in a variety of ways. So let me show you how I've done that. Now, what you've got here is a blank page because I'm about to throw up a page that you never do in a slide presentation. I'm going to do it a second time, and it's not going to be the last time I do it. I thought it was best if I just put my assignment up here and read it out loud. That seemed to me to be the best way for you to really understand how I pulled this off. So here we go. So click. There we go. I, this, this goes to the students in Canvas. The aim of this assignment is to ask you to think about religion and evolution issues. Do Friday by midnight via Canvas. Okay, if you can prevent yourself, actually, I'm going to go up. Stop reading. I made a mistake and didn't tell you something. I teach ecology and evolution that this assignment was used in. It's for anybody that's going to be a science major, has to take, you know, especially biology or chemistry majors, takes ecology and evolution. This is day one of class, not day one of the evolution portion of the class, but day one of class. They have a homework assignment that night. And this is that assignment. It's really important it comes day one of class. So now we're back. Second paragraph, please know this assignment will not be graded based on whether you have the right approach or the wrong approach. That's so important, you guys. This assignment is focused on getting you to explore your current perspectives. If you don't tell them that, they're worried about what you want to hear. Then here's the task. Imagine you are at your place of work, sitting down at lunch with a peer who is not a Christian. During lunch, a conversation comes up about evolution and Christianity. Write out the conversation you have with this non-Christian peer. I know this is difficult writing two sides of a conversation. Just try your best. The first sentence is written for you below. Write approximately one and a half to two pages. If you are not a Christian, then please write the conversation the other way around. The peer is the Christian representing Christian views. And then you will notice it says, Peer, I think there's a lot of evidence that life on Earth evolved from single-celled organisms a billion years ago. And then they write their name and they write their sentence and they go back and forth and engage in a conversation. And I write to the bottom here, it says, keep this going, page and a half. I tell them, you know, this is side, this, this task already took up half a page, so you better give me some more. Um, they do a great job at this. It's it's quite phenomenal how how much you learn from them about this assignment when you give this assignment. And you don't need to say that if this is if you're in a secular environment, you could easily just say there's a Christian and a non-Christian, or there's a religious person and a non-religious person. Uh, and that would be perfectly uh valid without you putting a Christian frame on it. So a couple things. One, uh, day one, again, this was homework day one. That's important. And 
I then needed to, I told them I would read them all. Remember, there's 70 students, right? I don't read them all word for word. I skim them looking for a particular section where I could write a comment. This takes me quite a bit of time and it is worth it and it pays off because when I write a specific comment to a specific thing they say, um, it can be anything like, oh yes, I've read that book or I like how you phrase this uh, da, 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 or just, just some specific comment to something in there. They believe that you read the whole thing. And that goes a long way because the follow-up assignment too comes in about halfway through my evolution unit. So I first teach some ecology for a few weeks, then I teach eight weeks of evolution and I end with ecology again. So I bookend with ecology. So this is pretty far into my course. I'm a, a good eight weeks into my course at least. And I give them, I have them read a short paper uh, I, I will show you what this is on the next page and a, also a website post that I found. Then I asked them to apply the three R's that were in that paper to the original conversation that they sent me on day one. The they have to, uh, the paper talks about having respect, having recognition and having response and being hospitable. Then they have to engage in a real conversation with someone of an opposite view and record it. They can auto record it. Everybody has phones now. They do this no problem. They can video record it. And then they have to listen back to it and reflect and reply the three R's to what they said. Now, what you're going to see on the next page, we're not going to read through, but I've had people ask me, like, I don't understand how you did this. So what you have on this next page whoops, click, is the actual assignment I give with a link and you have the full thing here so that you can see what I did. Then what I wanted to show you was an example. I'm just going to admit the student to get that off my screen. Um, I'm going to show you an example of what one of the students wrote. Part one. This is where they critique their original conversation. In regard to the three R's of hospitality, I think I showed respect toward the other person's perspective. I wasn't imposing with my beliefs, and I clearly stated that they were either my own opinions or personal beliefs. I was gentle, so to speak. However, Looking back at the conversation, I could have used more recognition and response. I didn't necessarily shut down the other person, but I didn't open myself up to the idea of another belief being valuable. I didn't recognize the other person's position as one that holds value. I also didn't seem to have much of an internal response afterwards either. I was very firm in my belief, yes, but I didn't leave much room to imply that I considered my own beliefs afterwards. Now, you're thinking, oh, April, you know, you went and you dug around for this talk and you looked and you read 20 of these and you picked the best one. Honestly, I opened up one assignment. I randomly picked like 2018 or something. I clicked on one assignment. And I'm like, can I take something from that? I promise you, the students do this beautiful thing of reflecting on themselves and they do this on their original assignment and then they do it looking at their own uh, conversation that they just had with a person with a different belief. They'll they'll do a youth group leader or they'll do a friend from home or they don't tend to use parents. They might do a roommate. And it, it really, it works wonderfully uh, for what my uses of it are for in my evolution class. So it's your turn. I am sure there are a lot of other ways of being hospitable. Brian's going to paste in the link into chat. I'm going to go to it here. It is this lovely purpley pink color and I'll be quiet for three minutes as you put your great ideas on here and if you don't have any great ideas you might have just a controversial topic in your area that could be one of these things that provides that opportunity and you can just put that in here as well this person does debates in the origin class assigns students to have to have different hold different positions that they don't hold love that you got to learn that position in order to debate it. Love it. I see some people are writing, so I'll just wait. Keep my door open whenever I'm in the office. That's beautiful. That is absolutely right. If they know you're approachable, they know you can come and talk to you, they will. My little bubbles tell me a few more people are writing, so I'll let you keep writing.
online discussion to allow students to think and process. Oh, great point. Whoever wrote that one, excellent point. You give them time on their own because they can't do it on the spot. Love it. Set ground rules of class. Yes. All questions are welcomed, respected. Yes. Pair up with someone who holds a position on an issue student from yours. Explain it back to them. Ooh, I like it. State from the first day, uh, I do not grade beliefs. I grade knowledge. Perfect. I think I missed one. I don't know where you are. Do a getting to know you activity. They have to come to my office and they have to tell me about themselves. Oh, we have colleagues here that do that. I think that's a great idea. I taught at a secular campus and I always start my first class with, I am a Christian who will be teaching on evolution. And if you have a problem, see me after class. I love it. Yes, it's providing space. It's allowing them to have their own view. Controversial topic. Could a person with pro-life beliefs support pro-choice laws? Yeah, so many good topics when you spend some time. Controversial topics in science. So many exist. Um, uh, uh, one time when I was sharing this with a colleague, they were talking about, you know, even should we be spending money on space travel and all this stuff if we've got so many issues just right here on Earth? You know, there's just so many things. A flexible on assignment, due dates, recognizing that life happens. Thank you guys. Keep adding your ideas in. I really appreciate them. And I'm sure everybody else does because we're all learning from each other. We all have great ideas. And we're moving on to patience and care for others. Um, I almost feel like, do I really need to even provide a Bible verse for this? Because this is just basically all over the Bible. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, Ephesians 4.2, the NIV is, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. I have three different um, sources on the bottom of this slide in the notes for when you get the slide. Uh, I have uh, an article, Patience in Christianity Today. Uh, it's called Patience, and it's in Christianity Today. I have The Power of Patience in Learning. It's in the Harvard Magazine. And I have something called Care for Others. It's in a Methodist source. So just have some really neat, there's some neat stuff in those um, things I looked at in preparation for this. Uh, no matter a member's position or place, they should receive the same kind of care. Visibility should make us give more care for a person. Dr. Martin Luther King gave us that beautifully wise piece of advice. And basically, just open up the New Testament and you're going to see many more examples of that. So patience and care for others in the classroom. This particular section of my talk is just a little bit shorter because these are things that I you can do kind of quickly. So they don't need a lot of explanation, but maybe you have some things that you do that are longer. But um, I've tried out all of these. I got these ideas from colleagues because we uh, do integration in the classroom, faith integration in the classroom at Point Loma. It's a big deal here. So we, we talk about it a lot. Um, you pass out a blank three by five card to your students. Um, and they can write about their current anxiety about this course. So you could do this on day one, which is cool. You can do this the week of an exam, let's say on a Monday and your exam's on Friday. There's a variety of times you can do this. You can do this when you're going to introduce a controversial topic or right after you've introduced a controversial topic where they can write their anxiety. Um, you just shuffle the cards and then you pass them back out to students. Nobody has to put their name on it. It can just be a card without a name and now have your card. And I'm supposed to either think about you, especially if you're in a secular environment. You just, you know, send good thoughts, you know, towards this person. Or you can, at a Christian environment, you can ask them to pray for the person throughout the semester or at least throughout the week. These are just really neat ways for students to share and see cards from other people that they're feeling some of the same thing and to think about others and caring for others. Uh, another one is I would... My class, uh, no matter what classes I teach, they're very team-based. So students are sitting in teams or sitting in tables of four facing each other. It's a pain to move the classrooms around, but I do that um, for every session. And so we talk a lot about working in a team and what it is to work in a team means to listen to other people in the team and what's going on for them. So I wrote here on the slide, when in a team, figure out who's struggling and listen to them. Don't talk at them, but listen to what they're confused about. And you should help them. And I do a lot of this in the beginning of first few weeks of school when I'll go around to tables and I have them working all the time in groups on stuff during class. And I'll go to a table and the one student will look at me and ask me a question. And I'll look at the rest of the team and I'll say, do you guys know? And they'll say, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Or, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, why weren't you helping this person? Like, why don't you guys talk with each other? And so you just have to really model it 
and to, to really get it to happen. Mm -hmm. So what you see in this picture, this is an actual picture my students sent me from one of my classes. And um, I mean, it requires a little explanation. I have my students uh, in any class that has ecology in it, whether it's ecology and evolution or ecology and conservation, doesn't matter if there's ecology involved, they have to do, um, I cancel a whole lab session and they have to do a rest, a three to five hour commitment to a restoration project sometime during the semester. I have a pre-assignment, I have a post-assignment. And this particular picture comes from Santee Lakes. It's a lake in an area called Santee in San Diego. And Santee Lakes have ducks. And the ducks, some particular kind of duck nests in the trees. And each year the nests need to be cleared out uh, so that the ducks continue to stay in this environment. So one of the students in this team of four, I had multiple teams of four that went to this one. I think there was three groups of four, so 12 students. The student was afraid of heights and um, the team knew that. And everyone else had done and climbed up the ladder and, and done one of these nests in the trees. And they encouraged this kid to climb up that they had him and they supported him and encouraged him. And he got up on that ladder, was able to do this. And he wrote all about it in his post- journal entry to me about what the experience was like and how the team was there for him and how he felt cared for. So really, if you you can start cultivating this with very little time commitment early on in the semester, and you will, if you continue to remind and model it, you will see the students start doing this for each other. I didn't tell the students to do this for the student, for their fellow student, and they did it on their own. So I was very heartened by that. So let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, patience and care, Brian. If you can put that in the chat, I will jump over to the web page. Okay, I need more ideas for patience and care. I, I gave you one. What uh, other ideas do you have? And then we'll go to our last one after this. One more. See people typing already. Okay, people are typing away. I can see the three little dots moving. After Test retakes for students who may have had a bad day. That's lovely. That shows a lot of care. Look for students in lab who don't ask for help. Oh, great one. Don't look at grades during the semester. Teach them all the same. Yeah. Or anonymized papers. I've heard of that. So that um, students are putting numbers instead of names on papers. Set up the guidelines for group presentation work. Cover for students who could not be in class because they were sick. Um, Definitely great ideas to show patients and care. Have a box where students can submit concerns, fears. Oh, I love that. Summarize submissions, allow students to brainstorm possible remedies. That's great. And yes, these things take time. I've got so much to cover in science class, but if you do this occasionally and you just provide a five minute opportunity to review some of these, it, it, it changes things for your students. It changes the whole dynamic of the class. And it's better. And if students know you care, they will invest more in the learning. During class discussions, don't pick the first person who raises their hand. Yes. Wait for someone who doesn't raise their hand first to raise their hand. Yes. Never pick. You don't, if you don't see a bunch of hands out there, they don't know how to answer your question. And make anonymous all papers and exams. Perfect. So smart. On the Canvas and stuff, they have there's ways to do that as well. I can't tell them to you right now, but. Okay, I saw the typing stop. Remind groups to call on every member for input. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your ideas. Go on to our final fifth one. Of course, it's our last one. It would have been nice if I had seven and this was Sabbath, but five was enough. So this is Mark 135 from the NIV says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Uh, I learned this value of Sabbath and solitude from a colleague here, Diane Anderson, who does such a good job at this in her personal life. And she does an amazing job with her Gen Ed students. And I, uh, the activity I'm going to share with you in a minute is modified from something she's done. And she's just a beautiful example of the value of taking some time for you, for God, for self-care, you're in a non-Christian environment, call it solitude and self-care. So, so this is from Adam, uh, Adam at uh, Christianity Today. Sabbath is an invitation to orient our lives around a different rhythm of practice. 
one that recognizes the moral limit to what we should expect our bodies and our lives to produce and to the profit potential we should extract from ourselves and others. I really liked that one. Tim Keller, I have him twice in this talk. Uh, we need to stop to enjoy God, to enjoy his creation, to enjoy the fruits of our labor. The whole point of Sabbath is joy in what God has done. So we can connect our awe and wonder to the Sabbath and solitude as a science instructor. So that's what I do. So a uh, simplistic way, before I get to that, I recommend don't have assignments due on Sunday. Now that we have canvas and students can turn in things and don't have them due on Sunday. Have them do Saturday night at midnight. Don't schedule, because they don't have to do it Saturday night at midnight. They can do it Saturday at two in the afternoon, but have your de deadlines not on Sunday. And then don't schedule exams on Monday if you can help it to sort of tell them and, and explain to them what you're doing. I'm creating a space for you to take time on Sunday and not have to do your homework. Um, also, um, taking a Sabbath from technology to notice creation. So you might have students say, I can't take a whole day off. I just, I can't take a whole day off. They actually can. They're probably not using their time well, but whatever. They haven't figured that out yet. You can at least teach them how to take a Sabbath from their technology. So this assignment is getting at that. So again, I'm going to do what you never do is put this, fill in the whole screen up with the assignment. But I think it was the best way for you to really gain an understanding of what I do. I'm going to read it out loud. This is called Lingering in God's Creation. I do this for any class uh, that I taught in biology. Find an outdoor setting where you can be at least 20 to 30 feet away from any other person. Turn your phone off. Spend 30 minutes resting, sitting or lying down, and thinking about the creator God who loves you. And if you're in a non-Christian environment, you don't have to use that exact language. But I say, why 30 minutes in the assignment? And I tell them to read Revelations 8.1. Look around at the ecosystem and consider how it functions. we I always do this after I've taught about ecosystem. Think about the cycling of matter and the flow of energy and how that works to keep you alive. God created this incredible planet that you get to enjoy and that provides you with food and water and oxygen. And we've talked about all those things when we've talked about the functioning of ecosystems. Look at leaves and insects and listen to the breeze just linger in God's creation and appreciate it. Write and submit on Canvas a 200 plus word summary of your experience, your thoughts, including a brief description of where you spent your time. And then I include, and I say this verbally to them also, please do not submit a fake summary. If you didn't do the assignment, just don't submit anything. Integrity matters. We talk about integrity a lot in my class about not cheating. Who are you? Are you, know, are you willing to just lie anywhere you can? So we talk a lot about that. So what I'm going to show you on the next page, I hope I don't plop it right up there. Good. I didn't. It is going to be a student's response. I did not hunt for this. I actually read two this time because I will tell you the first one was very personal. And I didn't feel like even though you wouldn't know the student's name, it just felt like I didn't want us to feel like we're being a voyeur. So I canceled the first one and I went to the second one. So I'm going to put this on the screen and read to you. It's two paragraphs. I decided to do my reflection at Plumosa Park, which is a park in Point Loma that's located on Chatsworth Boulevard. On my walk to the park, I stopped by a boba tea house on the way. I was hoping to get the best out of my experience by sipping on a drink while just being outside. I included this to help you understand their personality. When I finally reached Plumosa Park, I put my blanket down and began to look at the clouds. Then I began to think about why it was really there to understand the ecosystem while living in it. I recall seeing a bee buzzing around my face. I initially swatted at it. Then I realized instead of swatting at it, I should think about why the bee was present with me. Bees are vital to our ecosystem because they pollinate plants, which in turn help with our survival. The bee left and I decided just to be, be in the presence of God, be in the presence of my body. That task was much harder than I initially thought. My mind began to wander and think about every other thing than nature. And I began to shake my head with doubt because I couldn't just sit still and think about one thing. Then I started to recite one of my favorite Bible verses, Psalm 23. My grandfather used to recite this to me every night before I went to bed in hopes of relaxing me. I focused on the I shall not want portion. I then began to relate to Saving God's Green Earth, which in parentheses here, I should tell you, this is a book that we uh, read multiple chapters from this book, Saving God's Green Earth. Uh, I'm giving a webinar, sorry. 
Hi, sorry, people knocking on my window. I apologize. I then began to relate to saving God's green earth. My mind was being impacted by things that were running my life. I wasn't able to just sit still in the presence of God. I began to think about how my heart has impacted my mind. There have been many things that pollute my mind, but I've been trying to emphasize the great things. A feeling of doubt came over me for a portion of my time at Plumosa Park. Then I tried to see God's light in which I was focusing on telling myself that I am worthy, that I am special in God's eyes because he made me that way. This is a biology class. I want you to realize that we can give opportunities for students to do their science, to do some self-care, to have some solitude, to focus on God all in our biology or our science classes by just carefully thinking about assignments and how we want them to reflect. So Brian, to you again, Sabbath and solitude. What are some other things other than not having assignments that you guys could do uh, for promoting and cultivating Sabbath and solitude with your students? Mindfulness breaks in class. Just a pause. Have a schedule assignment that doesn't include Sunday as an option to fill. Yes. I see lots of people writing, so. Fuck on that study of science can be an act of worship of our creator. Right? We've got worship. We've got the awe wonder of the creation. We've got this time together. It's really all connected. Meditate on the differences between how machines and creatures function best. Love that. Help them focus on their machines that they're using. <laughs> Another minute. You guys can finish up what you're writing. Watch a sunrise and a sunset to appreciate the variety of colors, a constant change, and the physics behind it. Yay, physics! Not send or receive emails on Sunday. Right, you shouldn't be sending out things either. Retire from committees that insist on meeting on Sundays. Agreed. In my physiology lab, they can adapt the Sabbath as a healthy lifestyle. They research the scientific benefits of rest. Observe a Sabbath for four weeks and measure physiological function over that time. Excellent. Set time limits and assignments. Write as much as you can in about yeah, X in 15 minutes. I love this. These are great ideas. Thank you guys so much. Uh, and people seem to be adding more ideas after the fact. I've noticed it's grown. So as I started with the same phrase, different picture, and I wish this was a picture of me with students, but I didn't have one like this. If we don't help students see the pursuit of science as a part of their faith, who will? You're being called to do that. And we are, there are so many ways that we can do that in our classroom. I gave you five ways to do that. You have the Padlet pages of ideas. And honestly, if you just Google, there are so, so many ideas out there that people have tried. And again, you've got your Smith & Smith book. So I am willing to take any questions. I will pop the slide back up. But I did want to, uh, Brian did mention that I was one of the authors of the Biologus Integrate Curriculum, which has 15 units. I couldn't find a picture of the 15 units, so you get a handful here. But um, this was designed for high school biology. Uh, it is a supplement. So it's an integration of faith part into the biology. Uh, but a lot of this stuff can be used in the college classroom as well. I have used a lot of it in my college classroom. So if you want more information about that, it's in the notes. There's a link in the notes. So you can just Google integrate. So I am ready, Brian, now to take questions and hoping that I can answer or somebody else that's listening out there can answer. Thank you, April, for that uh, inspiring and uh, practical presentation. So on your day one assignment, do you have any uh, feeling that they use chat GPT to get to that? To write the assignment? Yes. Yeah. And you know what? Um, we, talk, we talk about integrity starting right off the bat. And I'm going to assume 10 or 20% of my students are not going to pay attention to my whole conversation about integrity and they're going to use chat and they're going to write it and i'm not going to know and oh well i'm going to worry about the other 80 percent 
that are really there for the opportunity and I'm going to do the best I can. And I'm not going to ignore those 10 or 20%, but I'm going to invest all my energies in, in the people that are really there, which is the 80% to really care about learning. So yeah, do I, do I think people are faking these things? Um, yes, I do. I do think it happens. I, you have, you will be surprised how many times I get an assignment where the person says, I just didn't do it. It seemed like a fun assignment. And I couldn't find the time to do it. That was it. They'll write that to me because I've got, I've, I've developed this kind of rapport. There's an opportunity to not turn in a set of assignments. You know, you get X and row points that I won't count. So I provide space for them to just be honest with me and not lie. Yeah. While we're waiting. Um, how do you access the Padlet that you tool that you used? Is can you? Because uh, I'm not. I've never seen it before, and and it would be nice to know how to use it ourselves for. Yeah, it's an awesome tool. If you just Google Padlet, you're going to get a link. And I just logged in. I actually found out that our university has an account, um, and so they just made me a a person who can use one of the licenses that we have. And that was it. And I don't know anything more about Padlet except how to do these brainstorm sheets because I used to use Jamboard. Jamboard was so easy and Google stopping Jamboard. But Padlet, this is a great way to do uh, things with students in class because they can get right on in Padlet and also use it. But yeah, if you just Google Padlet, I think it's padlet.com actually. Okay. Um, it'll just show right up. I teach in classes where ethics is a real key part of their education. And uh, I have come to the opinion that uh, chat GPT and these large language models are just a fact of life now. Mm -hmm. So I actually tell the students, just let me know if that's what you've used, because I realize that they'll have to put in a lot of information just to develop their prompt in the first place. And I tell them, don't ever take anything straight off of the screen. You know, I want you to always edit it, but let me know if you've used uh, artificial intelligence. And I tell them up front, I use it to generate questions for some of their quizzes and things like that. Yeah, I, think, I use it I think a lot. It's, I think it's just like the internet. It's just a fact of life and we need to learn to work with it and be honest about using it. Agreed. I agree with you completely. Um, you could even have ask it to write a conversation and then you could have your students analyze, you know, using the three R's. How did that, how did that conversation go? There's just so many ways to do it practically. Um, and I think another thing that I, maybe I didn't explain really well, I think it's super important to tell your students why you're assigning particular things that you're assigning, to not only verbally tell them, because you're going to have 20 or 40% zoning out at any moment in time, right? Because we can only listen so much. So I, have, I put it in the, in the Canvas course with the assignment too. Why am I assigning this? I want, I want to hear your view on evolution and creation. I want to hear what you think. I want to understand you and listen to you. And then, she, and right, so um, I will do that for most assignments. I mean, I, I don't do it for a quiz. It's pretty obvious why I'm giving a quiz, but some assignments that are unique, and I try to give quite a few unique types of assignments. I explain what I, what is my goal of doing it. That seems to help a lot too. What do you do about students who just don't, you know, they spell evolution, E-V-I-L-U-T-I-O-N, and they just don't want to engage with the topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can think of one student, uh, maybe it was about five years ago. It was just before COVID. The student had done one of those summer camps to combat people that accept evolution. So, you know, and he was very, very bright. And he had every one of those little questions memorized that you're supposed to catch your teacher on when they're teaching evolution, right? Like he had probably got an A plus in this camp. There's camps out there how to how to come into our evolution classes and like attack us. There's places where they can learn how to do this. So um, he he was the best of anybody I've, I've, I've experienced in 30 years. He was by far the best. And um, what was so interesting to him was I met with him. I guess it was maybe. We'd already, we already have three weeks of ecology. So we already knew him. He already knew me. And it was probably two days into our evolution unit. And I asked him to come meet with me. And we sat in class and I, I just asked some questions like, tell me where you're coming from. Tell me what, what you, what you want me to hear. You know, and he was like, I learning about this. I got to learn about it. I got to graduate from this university with a biology major. I got to take your class. I don't, I have to learn about evolution. 
And so I let I let him talk. And then I said, okay, if you're going to be against it, you need to understand it so you can have even better arguments against it. And we had that kind of conversation. And then I said to him, it feels disrespectful to me when you're interrupting my lecture to bring up your question. I understand that you have a question. I understand it's super important to you, but I'm trying to respect you in class and I do the same kind of respect. And we gauge in this kind of dialogue. Now, would this work for every single student everywhere in life? No, but he seemed to tr get the gist of what I was getting at. And he got to the point where he'd only interrupt me about once a, once a lecture, once a day. Um, and I, I took that as success. And um, I'd always say that you make a really great point. Sometimes I'd even write his comment or question up on the board. And I'm like, we're going to tackle this one in about a week uh, when we cover something else. You know, I, I always try to validate the fact that you could have alternate opinions. And then always sits back to my same comment of you got to understand it if you're going to disagree with it. So uh, it's the best I've got. Uh, okay. guessing other people might have great ideas, but, um, have you ever gotten any flack from parents of, of students that you, oh yeah. yes, I am very lucky though. When we got pushback from parents, we absolutely get pushback from parents. Uh, I did not have to take responsibility for that. I was able to share that with my Dean or my provost who would then communicate with the parent. We had sort of a they had a particular way. Daryl Falk was at my university when he wrote mm -hmm. uh, his book in 2001. And uh, all the administration, everybody learned how to kind of work with people that were going to be really angry at us. And so I never had to work with the parents when it was combative like that, which was really wonderful. I worked with the students when the parents were paying the tuition, got mad. It was usually my dean, my provost, or even the president that would engage in conversations with them. And they were well-versed in how to do that. So I was very lucky in that I did not have to work with the parents. But they would say things like, we are a university where we discuss all sides of a lot of, a lot of issues. That is what a university does. I, I recall once, one time, my president saying to somebody, maybe this isn't the right place for your family because the mm. parent would not stop criticizing. And I thought that was pretty beautiful. I know a lot of people do not have that kind of support from their admin always. Mm. I was lucky enough to have that. I also chose a university where I knew I could teach evolution and it was accepted by mm. you know, the university as not all the people that work here accept it, but they accept the teaching of it. So I knew I was lucky in that. What other controversial issues besides evolution or origins have you encountered me or are you asking our audience well either one actually it would be interesting to hear from from the audience as to uh what they have encountered and how they've maybe they want some advice on how to how to handle it i would love if people would write those in the chat what are controversial issues you you encounter with your students any science topic, what are they? Or even non-science topic, because things come up, especially if you're in a Christian university, come up in the science classroom. If you guys could put that in chat, that would be awesome. Um, while you're writing that, uh, I taught senior seminar, and that small list I had for you, which was evolution, the GMOs, the uh, uh, research in developing countries, um, I, I think I had about six or seven things in there. We had students choose one and do oral presentations on those, uh, sharing two different sides. And we probably had about 13 topics. I don't have them at, at the ready, but um, just things that we knew people would disagree on. But we only have one chat, animal experimentation, great. Gender versus biological sex. Mandatory masking, COVID time. Yeah, and and um, now there's... a. Uh, Vaccines, right? Vaccinations, right? There's some just put in. Are there are there any yeah, specifically chemistry or specifically uh, physics or engineering types of? Um, you know, I would say with the engineering, it's sort of um, you know, is it okay that we keep um, developing 
AI in such a way that maybe it can start thinking for itself type of stuff. Those are interesting conversations. Um, yeah. Ryan, do you see my hand? Oh, no, sorry, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, uh, April, I was, I was wondering, do you ever use, since we're you want to get into physics and that sort of thing, do you ever use some of the laws of physics uh, as they apply to evolution and, for example, cephalization uh, and and the fact that, uh, you know, our brain uh, is is in the front of our body, in front of fish's body, which we eventually evolved from, uh, because and that's where all of the special sensors, uh, the our, our special sensory receptors are located, because that's always the place where the greatest information is coming from. The most the information most important to survival is coming from, et cetera. Do you ever do you use that approach at all to help them to understand that you know God is really quite a uh, a creative thinker and has put a lot of thought into how he would eventually eventually produce us through evolution. Yeah, I haven't. Um, it's a super interesting idea. Um, I, I've used a little bit of physics in other ways in my classes to just talk about, you know, the maximum capacity of a cell and why it's limited to a particular size, why we can't have giant cells, um, various other kinds of things. But I haven't used it in, in the way that you're referring to. I It makes me jump to things like sponges and uh, those types of organisms that are more complicated, sort of the incredible biodiversity. I go right there and I think, yeah, I want to account for all of those things. But yeah, no, I haven't. But it's super interesting. Why don't we bring this to a close? want to thank April for being our guest speaker this evening, for all of you for joining us uh, for this presentation of the Affiliation of Christian Biologists. Um, if you're interested in getting more information about the ACB or its parent organization, the American Scientific Affiliation, you can um, send us an email at asa at asa3.org. Again, asa at asa3, the, the number three, dot org. Um, and I should tell you, we have an exciting series of at least three and possibly four events related to human consciousness and the soul coming up. We're co-hosting uh, this series with uh, the affiliation of ministers, theologians, and philosophers at the ASA. And uh, you'll be hearing more about this upcoming series soon. You won't want to miss it. Uh, so as we uh, close out this evening in prayer, I'd like to ask the, uh, the ACB Vice President, Carl Pinkham, to, to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Brian. Let's bow. Lord God Almighty, creator of the universe of cosmological, chemical, and biological wonders, we praise and thank you for the gift of teaching, especially the privilege of teaching all the intricate and fascinating biological wonders, and in doing so, receiving the blessing of knowing by the light of understanding in their eyes that we have successfully transferred a fully formed thought in our head to the same fully formed thought in theirs. We thank you for April Codero, who gave us knowledge this evening to help us accomplish this feat better and to do it in ways that bring the glory and honor to you where it truly belongs. Thank you for her clear message that provided resources and practices to apply to our teaching and made those of us who were teachers wish we were back in the classroom to apply some of those practices. Bless all of those who participated in this event tonight, bless the American Scientific Affiliation, and bless the Affiliation of Christian Biologists. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit the three in one God. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Carl. So watch for updates from us for future events. And if you have time, check out our uh, ACB group pages on 
Facebook and LinkedIn. We just set those up and uh, would love to engage in dialogue with folks on those sites. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to make resources available on those sites. And, and April, you're going to send me your slide set, right? Um, and I will make them available on those, those group sites as well as on the ACB page uh, on the ASA. So between all of those, everyone should be able to access one of those. All right. Thanks again, April. And thank you all. Um, and uh, until next time. So long, Thank everybody. you, Brian.